Happy holidays and happy new year. Thank you for taking the time out to watch this Humboldt Grace Legacy Project video. My name is Lillian Dubois. I am the founder of the Humboldt Grace Legacy Project. We are a diverse group of plant lovers from across the globe who come together once a week as volunteers to create solutions in this new market. We have been focusing on how to find a pathway to protect, authenticate, and validate genetics in the new marketplace. In this particular clip, you will hear from Kevin McKernan, Joshua Stroud, Brian Hill, John Brower, and Martel Yip, and myself, as we ask Kevin McKernan questions around his latest discoveries on the hop latent virus. And I'm sure. concerned that Kevin might have to leave at noon. And I would really love to hear from him what he sees coming up in the marketplace um, and any thoughts from last year that he might have to add to the conversation. Kevin, are you with us? I am here, yes. Um, sorry, to, I don't mean to cut anyone off, uh, but I'll tell you what I'm up to. That's what you want. <laughs> yeah, and I and I what you're up to and what you think is coming. Anything you know to help us kind of like you know what what do you think is going on and what we can help educate out there through these communities. Um, well, so uh, we've been doing a lot of work lately on hop latent viroid. Um, we've been sequencing a lot of the viroids genomes. We've been sequencing a lot of the plants that are infected by it, um, and uh, we've recently put out a preprint about something we found. Um, that was quite uh, surprising, actually. The, so so the, we think we understand how the viroid is now ex exerting its pathology on plants. And um, there may be a reason to believe that the cultiv cultivars you guys have that are outside of the commercial space we have right now are more clean of this and may have more resistance to it. Um, this will take me a little bit of a, a while to explain, but um, if you go through this paper, what you'll see is that this really short, um, uh, sequence that, that this viroid contains, it doesn't code for any protein. So all, its mechanism of action is to just downregulate certain cannabis genes that have that share sequence similarity to the viroid. And when we scan the cannabis genome, at least the Jamaican lion genome that we did all this work on, we find about 25 genes that it has some sequence similarity to that it may be downregulating. Uh, now, we can also scan through all the Canopedia, which has over, now it's close to 1800 strains in there. And we can catalog how many of those strains actually have differences in the regions where this viroid attacks and catalog those. And we've been starting to make a list of all the strains we have in Canopedia that have variants in the regions that this hop latent viroid seems to target. Um, so this is beginning to give us a, a good reason now to sequence the viroids genomes because they're quite different in every infection uh, that we come across. And then, of course, sequence the cannabis plants to see if we can start to um, design a plan to breed a way out of this. The, the reason we're interested in breeding our way out of this is that the hop field has not gotten rid of this in 40 years. Uh, what they have done is found cultivars that are less affected by it. Uh, now, there's a, there's a bit of a detail in this uh, in that uh, we are currently screening a lot of cultivars or clones, if you will, in the grows with PCR. And uh, we do not believe the plants that, at least the hot plants that are quote unquote resistant to this are truly resistant. Uh, we think that they're just tolerant of it and the viroid still exists in them. Uh, so we've got to be very careful right now that if we run and PCR screen everything and kill everything that's positive, we're going to also kill the plants that are tolerant to this, that don't dud as hard. All right. So, um, so why do I think there might be some uh, benefit to some of the cultivars that are out in the field? Well, there's probably an enrichment for this in the nurseries because a lot of the nurseries are using techniques in enriching for plants that like to root and are really responsive to rooting hormones. Uh, the whole, the whole um, cloning process kind of enriches for plants that like to root. The viroid loves to replicate in the root. That seems to be its reservoir. Um, wow. And when we look at the, uh, the actual hop market, uh, you know, th this thing can jump from hops to cannabis. It's been seen in tomato. Um, other viroids like it, like hop stunt viroid, has been documented to move in fusarium spores, to move into fungal mycelium. So I, I don't think getting rid of this is going to happen. It just has too many other res reservoirs to run to. 
Uh, so we're going to have to probably breed our way into a direction that can tolerate this thing being around. Um, that also means we've got to be very like cautious with like aggressively PCRing everything uh, and, and killing everything that's positive. I think we want to encourage growers to actually create uh, a place where you can retain mother plants that you think are very valuable, but you want to try and resurrect or you want to try and breed them to a better place instead of just wholesale cutting everything that's positive. Because you might, you, in the process, you might be cutting down plants that you ultimately want to breed with um, to get our way out of this, this conundrum and off this whole um, PCR treadmill that I, that's starting to emerge uh, in the market. Yes. Um, so the, the, what are the reasons to believe that the cultivars out in the field might be different? Well, these haven't gone through this selection of, of cherry picking out plants that clone well. And I, I'm worried that this cloning process that is very sensitive to rooting hormones may in fact be um, something that is very susceptible to, to hop latent virate infections. And that the plants that haven't gone through that type of selection may in fact be a better gene pool to be searching for uh, that may have some level of tolerance to this thing. Uh, I don't have any support for that latter statement. That's just kind of my evolutionary look at the problem that we are seeing a, a lot of this moving around nurseries because there's a lot of cutting going on in nurseries and it moves with, with, with cuts. But um, there's also a lot of rooting hormone going on. And we do know that uh, this thing is, it loves to be in the roots. That's where we think it's replicating. It's the highest copy number. And you can sometimes not find it in other parts of the plant, even though it's in the roots. So um, uh, anyway, we think this year is going to be a good year to be doing some breeding work uh, to try to breed our way toward cultivars that have mutations in the regions that this viroid targets. Uh, we've already found five in Canopedia that have mutations in the region that this thing uh, shuts down on COG-7. It's a gene in cannabis that's involved in shoot apical meristem growth. And the, the best homology we have in most of the viroids that have been sequenced to date, there's only about 162 that have been sequenced, um, uh, is to COG-7, which is this gene responsible for, for shoot apical meristem growth. Uh, so that, that, that makes sense that, that that's the pathology. There's another gene in there called Kalos uh, synthase, which is what makes a protein involved in the plasmodesmata of the cells. These are the pores between the cells. So when the viroid gets into a cell, it can then shuttle between cells going through these pores if it can open the pores. Uh, and it does happen to have some homology to callus synthase, which is one of the corks for the pores. So it seems to be shutting down the expression of what clogs up these pores so that it can enable its um, expression to other cells. This has been seen actually in um, potato tuber spindle viroid. They've shown that it shuts down callus 7 with this callus synthase gene as well. And the fact that it's doing it in cannabis is actually quite interesting. Um, so there's a handful of these genes we want to keep our eye on. Uh, we want to look for mutations uh, that exist in the cannabis population in the genes that this viral targets, because those are probably going to be the things that can survive um, this type of um, infection. Now, when I say survive, I mean the genes will not be effectively shut down by the viroid, but the viroid will probably still get into the cell and move around. Uh, so that's just something to think about in terms of, it's not your typical, what you might think about in terms of resistance, that the plant just has a big shield on it and it keeps all the viroid out. Uh, it, it's something where the viroid will probably get in, it will have less of an impact, uh, but you'll, you'll still be able to detect it. Um, this is kind of where the hop field is now, is they have cultivars that don't have as high of a secondary metabolite reduction with the viroid and they don't see as much dudding in certain cultivars, but they're not PCR negative. So... Um, Anyway, that, that's that's where we're we're looking to you know we're looking to go in 2023. Uh, we're looking for people who actually have this problem in Massachusetts because there is problems moving this stuff from California to us uh, because the roots technically can't go in the mail. We've had lawyers review this again, and even even like the hole punches people might be sending around across state lines, um, you know, technically don't fall within the compliance of the Hemp Industry Associated versus the DA. Uh, we have them looking at that legislation to see if anything has changed recently. Uh, to enable more shipment of research material. Um, it's unclear right now if, if that's been liberalized at all. But, uh, you know, if you know of anyone in the Massachusetts area struggling with this, we'd love to be able to reach out to them and try to get a research program going so we can try to um, be better study what's going on with this viroid. And um, we would immediately start off sequencing the viroid genomes they have uh, and then uh, looking at the uh, some of the characteristics of the RNA of the plant um, to understand if um, there's a way to breed our way out of this. I know a few growers in that area, Kevin, and I can have the conversation with them over there for sure. Yeah, and I, 
I do too. I I had a couple of questions real quick. No, I have I'm, a trillion questions. About but what go you ahead, said. Josh. That was incredible. I, I bet. And I, and, and it so was that was a real download right, right there. Yes. <laughs> Thank yeah, you. Yeah. Here's, so, a, well, here's a site for you. Let me just, just throw so this in the chat. Um, go on. I'm sorry. I'm going to put something in chat for you guys to peek at while we do this. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so that, that won't like work on a phone, but it will PCR work on a test. Oh, go ahead. Okay. What you're saying with a with a um, uh, PCR test and people calling their their strand their cultivars, uh, and then you mentioned ones that may be resistant or or whatever, but those can still it if it shows to be resistant but still shows a positive PCR test, they are still able to spread to other cultivars though still, right? Or not? That, that's or possible, yeah. So yeah. That, that's why isolation is probably key. And I think you want a different mentality for dealing yeah. with disposable clones. I mean, those, if they're positive, get rid of them. Um, but the mother plants, if you have a mother plant uh, that's very valuable to you and it's positive, isolating it until you can get a better understanding of what's going on. And if you have the real estate to do that, obviously, I know it's not easy. Um, it's tough. Uh, might, might be I, can wise. Offer, I can offer that help to people though, uh, because I do have a quarantine facility that I'm using for my own that could potentially have that, or or when I, especially when I bring in other people's, you know, stuff from other farms, I quarantine it, clean, not mixed yeah. with my green pool. Yeah, just to make sure it's still good, and you know, that's something I I can offer because I'm one that. Uh, you know, in a sense, a strain hoarder, where even if my plants have had disease or problems, I still. We lost you, John. Even, oh, sorry. All right. There. Yeah, I push things through um, even to where, uh, you know, battling things as far as even russet scares and things like that. But, right. you know, it, yeah, we got around. But, um, and, and then the other question I have is, the, you said you found five cultivars. Is one of those the one that you talked to me about with the the PhD strain, or uh, is that I something? Recall, I, so I, I have the the the, the actual RSPs, uh, which are the IDs and Canopedia, are in our um, are in our manuscript. So I'll have to go and, and pull those those exact numbers to okay. Point them I, out I to think you. so. Yeah, from what you said, but now, the the ones that we found, the five that we found so far, are only five that have mutations in COG seven. We're in the process yeah. of looking for ones that have mutations in, in the callus synthase gene I mentioned and the other 23 genes that we have our eyes on. And that, that list will grow. It'll, it'll become even larger um, because there's, there's other modes of, of um, knocking this thing back. Now, to the point of PCR positivity, um, so, so screening clones can probably be done because um, since they're disposable, no, one, no one's going to bother to test a clone twice because the cost of the PCR test is probably more than the clone. So people are just going to probably do very fast, dirty PCR or, or tests on those and, and, and kill them when, they, when they're hot. But mother plants that are very valuable that you might want to breed with, particularly plants that you feel um, did not exhibit as extreme of a phenotype when infected. Those are really important ones to collect and gather. Uh, like if you, yeah. if you have two plants that, and one looks asymptomatic compared to the other, uh, that's really important information uh, because okay. the, the one that's so asymptomatic- if it, if it is, still produces how a grower would want, let's say, but it came positive, but you're like, well, that, yeah. So that that, that is problem. probably one of the most valuable cultivars you could have around right now. Uh, okay. and, and I'm afraid if you're not careful with what you're doing with PCR, you'll kill it. Um, but exactly. this does bring a, a lot of attention to, to have using tests that are very transparent on the CT value. Uh, this is the value in PCR that tells you how much virus you have, uh, because that is probably going to be a, a really important metric for us to follow through the course of this. Um, you know, things when people start calling the viroid at very late CTs, I'm, I'm, I'm a little skeptical that, the, that you actually want to kill those. Those might, in fact, be plants you want to keep uh, because it shows that they're able to, to maintain uh, the viroid load down and keep it down particularly if you do this testing in the roots because because if the roots are where it's most concentrated and if you find things that are, have a really low ct score i should say i'm sorry a high ct score which is which is inversely correlated to meaning a, a low viroid load uh, those if it's, if it's like that in the roots those are very, very interesting plants because they've probably found a way um, to suppress this and uh, those are the ones that you want to sequence their genomes and figure out what markers to, uh, to try and track to, to breed for um, uh, you know, further generations that, that are going to be more tolerant of this. And Josh, it is PhD. The link, if you go to the link that Kevin just shared with us, it goes directly to what it is. And it is one of them is the PhD. Awesome. 
So Kevin, um, oh yeah, look at that. Yeah, I, I didn't, so that's that's uh, that's on the point of submitted. <laughs> yeah, okay. I didn't I, I wasn't so that one exactly. came in after after we submitted our paper. Um, so that one's in there. Uh, so thank you. Uh, Punja submitted, I think, five or six genomes that made it onto this thing. This is a site that basically paints the top three homologies that the hop, and, hop latent viroid has to the cannabis genome. And so if you have it pulled up, you can see um, the COG-7 homology is in red. The, uh, the expansion gene is EXLA1, that's in green, and the clasp gene is in um, is in blue. We need to we need to put another twenty genes in here, which didn't fit. Um, uh, if you want to have some fun with this, you can click that zoomable link, uh, and uh, the, these things can move around on you. It's, it's really more eye candy. It doesn't really have that much more functionality, but it's sometimes fun to take a peek but at. But it helps. Uh, it helps me. Oh, it's going to take a minute. Um, yeah, it is a bit of a it's a bit of a memory drag. So um, yeah, grab grab on any part of that RNA, and you can move it around. <laughs> Or even click on a base. If you click on a base, it should be able to stretch uh, stretch the thing, which is kind of funny. No, it's not letting What's you do it. Base, That's bizarre. Kevin? Yeah, like one of the things in the ladder, like right there. Grab that U. There oh. you go. <laughs> Whoa. Fun, huh? Um, now, what you're going to notice with this viroid is even two to three single base changes in this viroid. And this secondary structure you're looking at will completely change. So if you if you page through this this Viropedia page we have and look at all the different viroids that have been sequenced out there, you'll notice they all have different uh, hairpin like structures that we're looking at here. Um, so the, the, there is a tr tremendous amount of diversity in the viroids. They they make a lot of errors when they replicate. And so um, the infection that you have this, this is why I think when people try to describe hoplate and viroid symptoms, everyone's got a different story. Uh, because everyone's got a different yeah. virus or viroid, um, cool. is that they're very, very different uh, viroid to viroid. Um, the same hop latent viroid, but it's different. It's got a couple mutations yeah. in every one of them. So okay. they, they end up folding, they end up having even secondary structure as a result of these mutations. And that does sometimes mean that they don't hit, they don't have full length hits to the cannabis genome. It, like sometimes these mutations are in places in the viroid that make it so that it has a weaker homology to COD7. Um, I think there's a couple in here that are that are even 20 or 24 base pair homologies that you can find uh, in here, and those ones um, are, are significant. 19 is kind of on the edge. Like we like to see things um, that are in the 21 to 24 base pair range for there to be RNA interference. Uh, however, what likely happens when this gets into the cell is the RNases in the plant start attacking this thing and cutting it up into smaller pieces. Something known as dicer comes in and chuck, chops it up into 21 base pair pieces. And even if just 19 bases of that of that 21 match cannabis, it can downregulate that cannabis gene. So this is why we're, we're highlighting things that are anything longer, I think in this page, and anything longer than, than 16 bases, homology is getting um, pulled into the database and, and categorized and then scanned for variants that exist throughout all of Canopedia. Well, I learned a lot just from looking at that. I can totally, you can totally see the differences. Yeah, yeah, so, so we have a program now at MGC that uh, where we can sequence these, these viral genomes for people to see, all right, well, which one are you actually infected with? We can load it up in here and then we, it, we can then paint what homology this thing has actually to your cannabis cultivar to see if there is okay what's what's actually going on which genes are knocked down in your cultivar and and maybe that will help in in guiding a path of breeding with other cultivars that have mutations in those genes so that you can you can get a hybrid of the two and perhaps knock down its its virility so i know this isn't really your lane kevin but i'm wondering if you could speak to a little bit to the commercial side of having, because you're talking to, I know two people in this group right now that have some really special things. And like, what is the, with this particular, because of the problem, like what should those folks do? Um, well, to so you know, the interesting thing about the first five uh, cultivars that we found in Canopedia that had mutations in COG-7 is we, we contacted um, we, we reached out to all five. I think we only got word back from maybe three of them. And um, they, none of them had any experience with hop latent viroid. So they, they have not, and that doesn't mean that they're resistant. That just means that uh, since they, they're mostly working with seeds, 
they hadn't yet come across it and they weren't nurseries. So it could just be the cultivars have never been challenged with it. Um, so some of those would benefit by actually getting some clones of them and putting them through a challenge study, try to infect them and then work with one of these testing labs to like, okay, what happens when it, can I even infect this thing? Uh, and uh, uh, Zamir Punja yeah. has some protocols on infecting things. Kevin, I, I was just going to say that to you actually, is that I, uh, you mentioned that to me in an email. And so I am in the process. I, I felt kind of crazy doing it, but infecting some of those because we don't seem to have hot viroid at our farm. So I'm taking them. Definitely and, isolate and, it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> isolate it. It's really nerve wracking. I'll tell you that. Yeah. Because I feel like I'm playing with fire here. But uh, I, I'm, I'm doing the same thing with a, a personal one I have, and I'm having a hard time. Uh, so I don't have a hard time I, infecting it or doing. Yes. It. <laughs> yeah. With Jamaican line, I'm having a hard time getting Jamaican line infected. Uh, so. Oh, well, that's really good. So that that was the question I have with, with what you just said. You guys were just talking about a second ago is that what can I because I have a clone clones and I happen to breed that cold. When I when I sent you the 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 uh, piece for testing. For sequencing, I was it, it was because it was in the process of a whole out, outbreeding. Like I, I've crossed it and inbred line and everything with it, but also kept the mother cultivar, the actual genetics. And I'm just wondering what's going to further this along for you and for for all of us to figure out what's going on. Besides, like, like is there any kind of testing? Like, is well, there better testing besides PCR? I should put this through to find out. Like, what kind of data is going to really Okay. I think the sequencing of the viroid is key and of the mother plants that you're doing it with. And we, we can help with that. Uh, many of these things were, uh, if you can get us the material, we'll do it and, and put the information public on the house because we, we well, just what, kind of what, unravel this yeah. thing. Okay. So what, what material though? Cause you did already sequence it for me. It's, did we sequence your, your viroid and, and, and your not the viroid? Uh, I'm not sure about that. Yeah. So yeah. I, I guess we didn't talk about that. I, I'm trying to wrap my mind around what you're saying. I want to be able to, to help since this plant's still alive right now and keeping it going uh it doesn't seem to have any effects of any you know whether it's you know i don't believe it to be infected but uh i still haven't even done a pcr test of it because i just haven't found any in our nursery at all yeah and and that so one we do have um we do have some collection kits that can legally get material to us across state lines they use petioles and sometimes the petioles aren't don't have the highest viral load but we can but with pcr we usually um we can usually um coach it out of there uh, we use, okay. use a few more cycles of pcr to try and get it to go uh, and that that allows us to sequence it um, well, wouldn't you wouldn't you still maybe possibly even have samples of that there since I sent like a couple of tubes or I'm not sure how your process works. Oh, oh I'm sorry, I was trying to connect you with that. So those are sequenced. We do have those artists. I'm sorry, you work with Colin? No, conscious cultivators, Josh. Conscious, okay, uh, but yeah, uh, I think it was was Colin Palmer the one who put us in touch? Uh, no, it was Layla. No, it was through it was through this project. Yeah, oh, maybe okay. just so, on a call here. Yeah. All right, I guess we have to just sync up on. Uh, on yeah. um and what came in I, i'm confusing a couple of different projects i've got that's all right so, sorry <laughs> so are you able to get um because you sent me a follow-up email about it and you said hey, hey this looks like it has uh, uh i can't remember what you called it but the seven um oh the cog seven uh variant okay variant yeah so now with that like what kind of you know aside from a, a you know infecting clones of the plant to see what happens um you know, were you, are you able to sequence that viroid out of what you have? Already so what we're, or? What, what we're trying to do at the moment. Um, oh, I guess it might yeah. not be in there, though. Yeah. So anyways, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So if you if you have something that's that you've just infected, uh, we'd want to get uh, DNA or RNA out of that. Um, uh, okay. you know, one of those preps uh, that we do. And I can I can coach you through that or um, a petiole out here that we that we can take over the DNA and RNA prep of it. And then we would so look for after after we purposely infected you want yes. in, in fact, you want it. okay I, I and ideally take something I, from what i've heard from punja is it takes about two weeks for it to show up in the roots and another two weeks for it to show up in the leaves um and so what we're trying to do is capture material at week two and week four and sequence them both um and uh, and and track the rna changes in the in the cannabis plant through the course of infection um, that's what I'm trying. I'm trying to get done with Jamaican line is infect it and then watch it like a movie and see how its RNA is changing uh, week two and week four. That'll show us which genes get downregulated. Um, the other thing we're, so, we've got a project so that goes from different stages of timeline. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You, right. And um, 
Oh, wait, I have a question here. Sorry, this is Marty. So what you're saying, I don't mean to interrupt this this thing, but I'm trying to get gather what you're saying about this COG-7. Um, so you, what you're saying is if it's infected and it still can like power through and make a finished flower, that's that's right. And those are the genes that you want to work with. Yes. Or Yeah, that, so, might, that might be the most valuable plant around. Oh, okay. Got I one got that is, is, is asymptomatic but it's still PCR positive because um, I, I honestly don't think we're going to get rid of this thyroid. Uh, it's just no, got too many other reservoirs. <laughs> yeah, um, you got to breed plants that are tolerant to it, but it might still be it might still be able to travel and replicate in the plant, and there and also maybe still be infectious, which is something we have to you know be concerned about with sterile technique and cuttings and everything. But um, this, uh, I, I don't know that it's a, a good path to necessarily just constantly be PCRing everything all the time until your plants are clean because someone's going to reintroduce this. Um, I mean, right. even, so even with tobacco yeah. mosaic virus, they were finding that smokers could carry tobacco mosaic virus into other cult into other grows and transfer it because it was in the it was still active on the actual tobacco and cigarettes. Right. Yeah. So, you know, that was my so, follow up okay, okay. question with. With uh, thanks for explaining all that because I was trying. I'm still trying to wrap my mind around us all, all too, Marty. But um, what like am I? What kind of risks? Or I, I know you might not not know the answer to this, but um, you know it's going to be at an old medical facility where I have this plant growing. That it's just it's it's done. It has it's probably no one's going to grow there for a while. But am I risking carrying that in any other kind? Like it could be in the soil that the hop viroid or yes yeah or, i would assume that it, it can get into the roots it can get into the um the soil if you're if it's in if it's sharing a root bed with with other plants you have to be concerned about fungal trans you know mycelium transmission yeah. of plants more more um, so i guess i would just throw the soil away to the landfill or something i guess or yeah you know like yeah like i we're treating this like biohazard in a sense anything around this where I'm yeah. going to be introducing this viral because I and, still and don't more, understand how much it can spread, but you bring it up the tobacco mosaic virus and tobacco smokers, like it's pretty freaky, right? Like, should I, you know, yeah. I'm Mr. Roger in it, right? Like I'm taking my shoes off when I leave the facility and leave them. Right, there, right, right. right. Shoes. Okay. Uh, bleach, bleach is the answer, not ethanol or isopropanol. Okay. Um, okay. It, it does not, uh, the ethanol and isopropanol don't kill the thing. Bleach does though. Um, so that, that that's, uh, yeah, I would treat it like, um, uh, and of course, the we don't yet know if it moves and flies, but I suspect it does. I suspect it does move in insects. And that so, was what I was wondering too. Okay, well, thanks for that insight. It really helps all of us. Yeah, really does. And John, uh, like, aphids, aphids. I always uh, research. Oh that. man, aphids. Yeah, yeah. aphids. Uh, leaf leaf yeah. hoppers are moving beet curly top uh, virus around. So um, you know that's that's been documented, and and we saw LCV move around with white flies. So I just have to. I'm just assuming. Uh, eventually, someone's going to find hop latent virus moving around in these in, in in the past. John has a question too. John, I see your hand. Yeah, super fascinating conversation. Uh, I wonder if you could rewind a bit and go back to the relationship with uh, Fusarium. I've got several uh, projects going in Trinity County where folks have uh, grown on the same hill or the same terraces or even in the same planting holes for many many years and occasionally we'll see uh plants having problems uh starting early in the season and uh and some of the plants uh have worse problems than others and oftentimes we just kind of give a blanket kind of broad diagnosis of well you know we dig down into the hole and it smells like yuck so we figure well it's anaerobic down there so you've likely got fusarium or pythium infection or, or something like that um so my usual uh advice on something like that and something i've got going right now are several uh projects where i'm managing the composting of the soil dug up out of those holes and so you know my kind of standard uh therapy is comp get that stuff to compost hot right get it all the way yeah. up to thermophilic temps like you know 145 150 uh fahrenheit so we can get pathogen kill and try and start over fresh um but can you the fusarium maybe what we've always kind of called fusarium maybe, i mean it's there's no telling what it is without a test but 
I mean, this relationship between the viroid and fusarium or, or known Vusar, fusarium is super fascinating for me. And it's, and it's really pertinent to like this moment on the calendar as this composting, as these composting projects are going on. Yeah, so there is a, um, there, there's a list of these genes that it has homology to. And I remember if I go back to some of them, I have to, I have to pull out the exact gene in the, in the paper that I think is playing a role here. But some of the genes that it had homology to that I think it's down regulating, are related to pathogen response. And so it might be that the viroid, if it goes to high copy number, it lowers the plant's capacity to fight off fusarium. Fusarium comes in and then acts as a mechanism to transfer the viroid to other plants uh, by, by sporulating. This is all speculation on my part, but, but you know, they've seen this, they've seen fusarium transmit other viroids. So, um, and they're in the same class as this viroid. They're, they're either hop stunt viroid or, or very small viroids that are in the same viroid um, taxonomy. So uh, I would anticipate over time, we, someone will probably find fusarium spores to be carrying this with, uh, if they do the right controlled study and, and demonstrate this is in fact happening as it is in other things. So, um, whatever you do to, to perhaps, uh, if there's, I, I would look maybe to bacteria that don't sporulate and spread that way to fight off fusarium would be a good play, like uh, lactobacillus or some of these other uh, uh -huh. microbes that people use to try to fight fusarium and push that down. Uh, that may in fact be a better uh, uh, microbiome to have that doesn't, because the, the bacillus isn't gonna, isn't gonna sporulate and spread in the wind. And it's not gonna make a mycelium network that can move it you know, plant to plant. Um, and uh, now the only problem with using any of these biological approaches is that you do have to be careful of how you're getting this stuff tested because um, the, the bacillus will trigger a total aerobic count test. I don't think you have those in California, though. I think California is only E. coli, salmonella, and forest bagillus species for testing. So you can probably yeah. use um, uh, these uh, biologics and uh, quite, you know, with a lot of success. And, but and, historically, and, we, uh, we've had the best luck when uh when we do this composting with a compost a lactobacillus uh type compost starter even like just whatever the cheap stuff is that week off a hardware store shelf yeah the the other um idea i've heard circulate which makes sense to me from like a molecular biology standpoint is jasmonic acid um uh, that the treatments of that's uh, that may in fact stimulate the immune system um uh to help drive this out or at least lower it and make it so it's not as um, that doesn't exhibit as much dudding. But th you know th that's really early work. I've I've heard through the rumor mill that people are playing with. Um, I think there's a paper from um, Berkowitz lab at, out of Yukon that's looking at this to change like secondary metabolite um, expression in the plant with with some success. And and uh, that's one that's worth looking into. That's published. Uh, I'll, I'll try and uh, forward it to the crowd when I when I can dig it up later later today. Awesome. Thank you. So you guys, um, it's one, it's one thirty-one or twelve thirty-one. Sorry, twelve. I'm looking at the wrong thing. It's twelve thirty. Um, I was wondering, Kevin, if maybe not once Josh starts jumping in, or Josh, I can. It's really up to you. But I was wondering if we could take that first part of the conversation where you explained what you see going on. You know, we just talked about recreating content. We have another conversation. We have a, a, another conversation that we're going to recreate with because some really good information came out of it. Could I do something with this and send it to you for your approval, everyone on this call's approval, and see if we can not share that? Because this is like really important information for people to hear in our community right now. It, it is. I was going to ask the same thing, mainly because I really need to... I really need to show this. I'm not with my crew right now, but I really need to show my crew and my teammates, the people farming with me on our facility and, and why I've been, you know, why I've been bugging them about our, our SOPs of not spreading things, not bring, they always want to bring in new stuff. I'm like, no, we're not doing this. You know, it, it'd be really helpful for me to get morale of my team and morale of fellow farmers to like understand what we're doing. So yeah, I, I second that if that's possible. I'd, I just love to even just show it personally to my farm. Kevin. Absolutely. I, I'm sorry. I just dug up your email, uh, Joshua. Sorry, I, I was flaking on that. <laughs> and I, I, now I know what's going on. Um, but yes, feel free to share this. Uh, there's also a, um, there's a Growcast, I think, coming out on this topic next week. Um, so I'll, I'll circulate that when it goes live. Please, please do. 
All right, you guys, I have to, I have to, this person's calling me like crazy. I have to get off the call and it's going to shut the Zoom. So I apologize. And all right. Talk to you all next Happy time. New Year, everybody. Happy New Year, everyone. Hey, Mike. Thank you again for taking time to watch and have a beautiful rest of your holidays.